Welcome to the Florida Gardener podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer, and here are 10 things you need to know when seed starting. Number one, select the right seeds. You want seeds that'll do well in our climate. Some of my favorite annuals include sunflowers, specifically compact branching varieties because you get more bang for your buck. One of my favorites is Little Becca, which is a dwarf sunflower that produces tons of copper red blooms on each plant. I also love Gumfrina, or Globe Amaranth. They are some of the most unique looking plants. They produce perfectly round one inch pom-poms. They sort of remind me of gumballs that you would get in an old classic gumball machine. Anyway, they have some lovely colors too. From Strawberry Fields, which is a red gumfrina, creamy raspberry, purple, and white. They also make great cut flowers because they last forever in a vase. Coxcomb, specifically Tornado Red, is another great annual. I think this one is super neat to grow with children. It reminds me of ocean coral, but it could definitely pass as some unique plant from another planet too. Super funky flower with fun texture. And it's massive. The alien-like flower heads can be 8 to 12 inches large. This is one you just need to Google. Marigolds are my fourth favorite annual to grow, specifically white swan. You guys, these aren't your grandma's marigolds. The flowers are 2 to 3 inches wide in a yummy cream color. They are just these delicious cloud-like marshmallows. And they have a long stem growing 2 to 3 feet tall, So they make an excellent cut flower too. Now some of you may be surprised, but zinnias don't make the list, and here's why. While they are charming and easy to germinate, I always end up struggling with some type of fungal disease with mine. I believe it's powdery mildew. I prefer not to use fungicides and other chemicals, so for me it's just easier to grow a different type of plant than deal with that. Now I'm in South Florida, zone 10B. If you're in another part of the state that isn't quite as humid, you may have an easier time with these flowers. Now let's move on to perennials. Some of my favorite perennials to start from seed include Florida native blanket flower, Florida native black eyed Susan, Florida native tick seed, and Texas native red salvia. I have all of these planted in ground in my yard and they bloom year round without any fertilizer or irrigation. Yep, you heard me right. They love our native soil, and I don't have to irrigate or hand water my beds, even in the summer. Low maintenance does not mean you have to sacrifice color or flowers. It just means picking the right plants. Now, what I love about all these seeds that we've discussed, the annuals and the perennials, are that you can plant them any time of the year down here. They all love sun and heat and grow relatively quick. Within 90 days, you will have mature blooming plants. Now, I prefer to purchase my seeds online. The variety is much better than what you'll find at a local garden store. I also prefer to purchase them this way because sometimes I want seeds that are grown in a specific area. For example, when I'm growing native blanket flower, I want the Florida variety of native blanket flower, not Idaho's variety. I'm not sponsored or affiliated with any seed suppliers, but to give you an idea, I purchase most of my annual seeds from Johnny's Selected Seeds, Baker Creek, and Swallowtail. I purchase all of my perennials from Florida Wildflower Co-op, with the exception of Texas Red Salvia, which I purchased from a Texas-based company called David's Garden Seeds. Number two, cold stratification and scarification. So you purchase seeds that do well in our zone and you planted them at the right time, but they are not germinating. Not all seeds will germinate simply by placing them in some soil and giving them a little water. Cold stratification is when a seed requires a period of cold before it will germinate. If you're not planting in a cooler month, you can simulate this by placing the seeds in your fridge or freezer. Scarification is when a seed benefits from being scratched or broken down a bit before it will germinate. This usually applies to seeds with a thicker, firmer exterior. In nature, this might happen when an animal eats the seed and their stomach acid helps to break it down before they excrete it back out. Wildfires also help to break down some seeds. You can try to simulate this by lightly scratching the seed on a sidewalk or with sandpaper. I've also heard of soaking seeds in warm water. I found that sometimes these methods can be tricky, at least for me, especially cold stratification. So make sure to research seeds before you buy them to see if it's a requirement and then decide what you wanna do from there. 
I personally prefer to stick with seeds that do not require either of these methods to germinate. And on that note, none of the seeds I recommended earlier in this episode require cold stratification or scarcification. Number three, you don't need to start plants inside and you don't need accessories such as mat warmers, grow lamps, or domes. Florida is a greenhouse. I would be more concerned about heavy rains than plants getting enough warmth and sunlight. I start everything outside. If it needs cooler weather to germinate, then I just don't grow it. The only tricky part is the summer rainstorms. Tons of rain can flood out seeds and young seedlings. So I'd say for the first month or so, I leave my seeds and seedlings outside but covered under my roof overhang or on a covered patio so that I can control how much water they are receiving. Number four, you don't need fancy cell trays or soil blockers. I've used old yogurt cups, plastic Folgers coffee containers, red Solo cups, even plastic containers or dishes that are used for takeout and ready-made meals. Any type of pre-packaged meal, I guess. Just drill a few drainage holes at the bottom and you're good to go. Why do I do this? Two reasons. Number one, it's free. And number two, most cell trays are really tiny. This means you don't have much time. Once the seedling sprouts, you gotta pot up aka put it in a larger container or go ahead and get it in the ground. Now one of the benefits of cell trays is they don't require a lot of soil but I found it's really not a big deal as long as you're not starting seeds in a massive pot which I wouldn't recommend that. That's where things like solo cups and yogurt cups come in handy. Don't use a large pot. Cell trays may also be better if you're a flower or veg farmer but as long as you don't need to grow enough flowers for the local farmers market you're really not going to use a ton of soil anyway. I have a lot to say about containers, clearly. I love the environment just as much as anyone else, but I'm also not a fan of using paper egg cartons or jiffy peat pots that break down. The reason being is they just don't hold up. You water that plant once and the whole thing is falling apart. I keep my plants in containers for one to three months, so it just doesn't work for me. Plus, I'd like to think I'm doing my part by upcycling my kitchen plastic, right? Number five, label. Make sure to label your containers so you remember what you planted and can compare germination rates for each type of plant. I just use a Sharpie and write directly on the container. Sometimes I write the date I planted the seeds too. When I reuse the container, either the sun has faded the old wording at that point, or I just mark through it and write the new seed name right next to it. If you prefer a cleaner look, you can write on some tape and adhere that to the container. Number six, planting seeds. First things first, I wet the soil before placing the seeds in. This makes it easier, that way the seeds aren't floating around after you have placed them where you want them. With larger seeds, some flowers for example, I will hand select each seed from the packet. If I'm using a solo cup, I plant one to three seeds per cup. You can lightly cover them with soil. With a super tiny seed, such as Black Eyed Susan, I'm just sprinkling a pinch full of seed into a solo cup. Once they germinate, you can thin them out, which means removing the smallest or unhealthy ones and keeping the largest healthy looking seedlings. You don't want to overcrowd the container as it will create too much competition for sunlight, water, and nutrients. And you typically don't need to cover small seeds with soil. Just make sure they make good contact with it. Use your finger to lightly press them to the moist soil. And that leads us into number seven. Soil. Seeds, at least the ones I have suggested, are not too picky. Use whatever you like. I just use whatever potting soil I have laying around. You can also use coconut coir or buy a special formulated seed starting mix, but it's not necessary. I just wouldn't use the dirt from your backyard, mainly because of poor drainage, and there could be a ton of weed seeds in it ready to germinate. You just won't know what you're growing. You also don't want to use anything with huge chunks of bark or mulch. Seedlings can't grow on a piece of orchid bark, for example. They'll have a difficult time finding soil and rooting. Number eight, the first two leaves are not true leaves. What I mean are the first two leaves that emerge from a seed are part of the seed embryo and are present within the seed before germination occurs. They are known as seed leaves and serve as energy reserves for the infant plant. These seed leaves never look like the rest of the leaves that the plant will have. 
but they are critical because they store food for the seedling until the true leaves are established enough to perform photosynthesis. Ain't nature neat? Number nine, heirloom versus hybrid. When purchasing seeds, you'll notice that some are described as heirloom and others are hybrid. You can seed start with either type, but it's helpful to understand the differences. If your goal is to buy seeds once and be able to harvest dried seeds from your flowers to save money and grow more plants, you definitely want heirloom seed. If you don't care about saving seeds from the parent plant to harvest and sow, then heirloom or hybrid will work. Heirlooms are like the OGs. These guys have been saved and passed down for generations. And you can harvest the seeds and grow another plant identical to the first one. Hybrids are like the latest and greatest iPhone. They are fancy varieties we have created based on old school heirlooms. Sometimes they get a bad rap, but I think they can be really great. Whenever you see a fun or unique variety of something, it may be a hybrid, something that doesn't look like it would occur naturally, a mini heat resistant carrot, for example. The cool thing is these hybrids are bred to have some really neat traits. Reddest, largest tomato or it could be resistant to certain pests and diseases, or have the largest, boldest colored flowers. But nothing comes without cost, so when they are bred to excel in a certain area, sometimes they fall short in others. You might have a tomato hybrid that is resistant to blight, but maybe it doesn't taste as juicy. So there are trade-offs. Another drawback is if you try to harvest and sow the seeds from a hybrid, you'll either get something that isn't true to type it won't look exactly the same as the original, or the hybrid may even be bred to have sterile seeds, so they won't germinate at all. You'll just be planting a bunch of seeds that never do anything. So when it comes to hybrids, you're not typically saving the seeds to grow more plants next season. You have to buy another packet. I like heirloom and hybrid seeds. It just depends on what I'm trying to grow, but usually my perennials are heirloom. My garden beds are full of Florida native heirloom plants that readily self-seed, which is what I want. My fun pops of annual color are typically unique hybrids, which I display in containers seasonally. Number 10. Why can't I just throw seeds out into the yard? I feel like no one ever gave me a direct answer to this, and it's important to understand. You can, but here's why you may not want to. Just throwing a bunch of seed out into your yard significantly decreases your germination rate. Compact soil, critters, I mean, squirrels love seeds, and so do birds. Another issue I found is weeds. How do you know if it's a seed germinating or a weed? At this point, my beds are well established. I've become very familiar with them, so this is not an issue. But in the beginning, I wouldn't have had a clue. Nature isn't perfect. Not every seed gets to germinate in the wild. Now, if you don't care about controlling the process, that's totally fine. And some seeds will do better with direct sow than others. All right, guys, that wraps up episode two of The Florida Gardener. We will see you next week for episode three. And in the meantime, if you'd like to download one of my Etsy garden templates or check out my social, you can access everything through my website, rootsredefined.com. That's roots, R-O-O-T-S, redefined, R-E-D-E-F-I-N-E-D, Dot com. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you again soon.